revolutionary right now. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today is Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. How many times have I told y'all Republicans are evil as hell? In Mississippi, they voted to expand the, the uh, state police in Jackson, even though Jackson supplies most of the sales tax to Mississippi. In North Carolina, a Democrat flips over to the Republicans, now giving them a supermajority, and they can now override the veto of the Democratic governor. In Wisconsin last night, Democrat Supreme Court justice wins. A special election, the Republican is leading. The Republicans will have a supermajority. They're already talking about impeaching the Democrat woman who just won. She hasn't even been sworn in. Also, Republicans across the country are trying to pass more voting restrictions on college campuses. I told y'all white students they were going to come for you too. Also on today's show, Chicago has a new, new mayor. Brandon Johnson will explain how he won and beat back all the naysayers. Also on today's show, uh, a Tennessee subcommittee, uh, they have approved a bill. This is their response to kids being killed in school to allow teachers to carry guns. Parents are outraged in Tennessee. And speaking of Tennessee, they're moving closer to expel three House members. We'll tell you the latest with that as well. Plus, Bowie State University honors Dion Warwick. We'll show you that ceremony. It's time to bring the funk on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Mississippi Republicans always talk about local control, but now they are one vote, they are one signature away from expanding the Capitol Police in the state capital of Jackson, the state's predominantly black capital city. Now, this particular bill, folks, uh, again, impedes on what's happening there in Jackson. Now, they can't actually explain this special district and why it's important and why it matters. What this is about, further control. Oh, but guess what? And we showed you this previously. The area where most of the white residents live in Jackson? Yep, that's where this special district, special police jurisdiction is going to be. Yep, that's right. Uh, the measure is going to create, also create a temporary court system outside of Jackson's control. That passed. Last week, Democrats say the new law could lead to un unnecessary police presence, undermine efforts uh, to have criminal justice reform in the city, and also some say this is simply Jim Crow 2.0. My panel, Scott Bolden, attorney here in Washington, D.C., Robert Patillo, attorney, host of People, Passion, Politics, News and Talk, 1380 AM, WAOK, Rebecca Carruthers, vice president, Fair elections. Here. And I'm glad to have all three of you here. Robert, let's just be be clear. And, and I, for everybody who's watching to understand, probably by the first 45 minutes of the show, I'm trying to walk people through to show them how crazy and evil Republicans are. Now, for all of these simpletons out there, especially these so-called new black media people, who oh, Roland Martin, you're a, you're a shield for Democrats. All right, all you <laughs> fools. I want to see are y'all covering these issues. Are y'all talking about what's going on here? Are y'all talking about how black people are being targeted by these Republicans all across the state? Or are y'all still stuck on stupid and trying to say, well, Democrats come from the same cloth. This is just very simple, y'all. This is just very, very simple. 
Jackson, Mississippi is a predominantly black city that black Democrats are running. What they are doing here, Scott, they are trying to, again, further encroach on the local government there because they don't like black people being in control. Well, they don't like what black people are doing while they're in control. That is being autonomous, if you will. Much like we don't have autonomy here in the District of Columbia. So it really is that encroachment. Um, I, I guess I, I was reading about this. I, I was wondering about how they sold this to be a race-neutral approach or what the, what the underlying need is. But all the Democrats voted against this. And I'm not sure why you have to carve out a section of Jackson uh, simply to have this expanded police force. So it really doesn't make any sense. It, it, it sounds like it's a, it's a solution in search of a problem when Jackson is doing just fine, like any other urban center, it's got its challenges, but that doesn't mean you need more police to harass more black people and black young kids. Well, what this is, Robert, uh, is Republican control. Republicans saying, we got the power, we got supermajority, we control the House, we control the Senate, we control the governor's mansion, we can tell y'all what the hell to do. Well, you know, I always find it interesting that Republicans call themselves the small government party. You know, they're supposed to be the ones of uh, give me liberty, give me death, and that uh, government should be so small that you can drown it in a bathtub, uh, as Grover Norquist used to say, that they want to have as little interference in the everyday lives of Americans by government officials uh, as possible, because that's what the founding fathers wanted. They've been telling us this for the better part of 100 years, so that is the Cassius Belli of the Republican Party. However, whenever it comes to black folks, all of a sudden, you need to expand government. You have to expand government agents to control those populations. You have to uh, expand uh, laws to make sure you can criminalize more behavior. You have to expand the footprint of the government when it comes to the everyday lives of individuals in those communities. And we know exactly why, because go back to the fundamental of founding of policing in this country. It was founded on the idea of slave patrols. It was founded on the idea of controlling black populations. So, of course, they want to create a special police forces outside the jurisdiction of the rest of the court system to patrol the black community, control the black community in those areas, because they do not uh, see the need to fix conditions that may cause problems. Why do that when you can con uh, continue to do what America has done for the past 400 years and criminalize black bodies, black souls, black spirits, and do that through uh, excessive government uh, interference in the actions and the lives of black communities? And do people just seem to push back against this? And if Republicans really want to be true to what they say they believe in, they should vote down a big government government measure, which will put more government in the lives of regular individuals. The thing here, Rebecca, that again, that I'm trying to explain to people so they can understand, is that what we are seeing, I wrote, there's a reason I wrote uh, this book, White Fear. There's a reason I wrote it. Because I need everybody watching, I need all these black folks watching to understand what is going on here. They are desperately trying to control blackness. They want to control black politics. They want to control black power. Now, I'm about to walk through. This is happening in Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, North Carolina, South Carolina. We can go on Georgia, Tennessee, Florida. And so folk need to understand, you're sitting your ass at home, bitching and moaning on social media. You better understand what they're doing, because this is about power. Roland, last week I was at Grambling State and I was talking to a bunch of student leaders um, from Grambling State, Dillard and Xavier um, students were there as well. And I was walking them through with what's happening in Jackson, what's happening in North Carolina, what's happening in Tennessee, what's happening in Florida, what's happening in Texas, what's even happening in Louisiana. And the overarching thing here, as you said, as we start to see um, 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 minority majority states, we're seeing that there's more attacks against black institutions. We're seeing attacks against HBCUs when it comes who could run HBCUs, um, who can be appointed to the board of trustees when we look at what's happening at North Carolina A&T or we're looking at what's happening at Tennessee State. And then we're looking at actual political power. When it comes time to actually have prosecutor prosecutorial reform, we see in Fulton County, Georgia, we see that the Georgia 
legislature, they're trying to strip power from local prosecutors. We've also seen before when we had a prosecutor in Baltimore County, uh, Maryland, um, who decided that she was going to hold police accountable. All of a sudden, we start to see a lot of these political attacks that then um, became um, legal issues as well. So across all of our black institutions, as we started to see the browning of America, it's not all people of color that's being attacked, but it's anti-blackness specifically. Because one thing that we know, we have civil rights in this country because of the role that black people have um, played in the civil rights movement. So this isn't just an attack on people of color, but this is specifically anti-blackness because of white fear. Oh, it, it, it exactly it. And again, uh, I, I just need people to understand. Uh, when we're talking about these things, folks, there's a through line here. I'm trying to connect the dots. Uh, I'm going to go to a break. We come back. I'm going to show you a couple of maps uh, that Rakia Lumumba, uh, the sister of the mayor of an activist and the sister of the mayor of Jackson, uh, Chokwe Lumumba, she posted on Instagram a couple of months ago. And then we're going to talk about what's happening in Wisconsin and North Carolina. Folks, I'm telling you, they're coming for black people. They're coming for brown people. If you, th you think I'm joking, wait till I'm done. And then tell me if I'm wrong. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. the hidden impacts of climate change that land harder in black, brown, and native communities. Not many people talk about it because they clearly don't know our lives. But with President Biden's landmark infrastructure and climate plans, our issues are finally seen. Removing lead pipes means we know our water is safe. Cutting carbon pollution helps our kids breathe easier. 1.5 million new jobs mean stable work in communities. The impact we need. Right now. Hi, I'm Israel Houghton with Israel and New Breed. What's up, what's up? I'm Dr. Ricky Dillard, the choir master. Hey, yo, Peace World, what's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, welcome back. Go to my iPad, please. Um, what, what, this is a map here uh, of the city of Jackson. Uh, Rakia Lumumba posted this on her Instagram page. Uh, this, she posted this in February 8th. And so what this is, is a, the black outline is the, uh, this is Jackson, Mississippi. Now, when you see the, um, you see the red area there, okay? Uh, that is what is called the Capital Complex Industrial District Expansion. That's what this bill addressed that, okay? Now, um, again, the dots in blue, first of all, let me clear. So you see all the green dots there? See the green dots, Rebecca, Robert, and Scott? See those green dots? Those, yeah. are, those are black people. See those blue dots? 
those are white people. So this map clearly illustrates that this capital complex industrial district is largely going to be servicing the white residents of Jackson, Mississippi. Now, there was a, uh, there was a second map uh, that was put out. Let me uh, go to that. Um, and then let's see here. This is the second one, all right? This is the second one right here. All right, so let me pull up this map right here. So this is from The Guardian. This is what they posted, okay? Same thing, all right? Um, and so this is what she posted. The measure would increase the geographic size of an improvement district in the downtown area of City of Jackson from 7.8 square miles to 25 square miles. It will create a new unelected judicial district within the city with two judges, two prosecutors, and two public defenders. They will be appointed by the Mississippi Chief Supreme Court Justice, a conservative white man. The prosecutors will be appointed by the state attorney general, a white male Republican. The district will be policed with an expansion of the Mississippi Capitol Police, led by Bo Lucky, a white man. He, a role appointed by the Mississippi Commissioner of Public Safety, a white man. It's abundantly clear, Scott, what we're dealing with here. It's almost like they're trying to succeed, or not succeed, secede, or accede, I guess, whichever word it is, from that the Jackson jurisdiction. They want their own criminal justice system because they don't trust the, uh, the city of Jackson. But there should be lawsuits, almost like an unlawful taking or the or violation of the due process rights and the sovereignty of the city of Jacksonville. I think this goes into effect May 5th, I think, based on my research, and there will be lawsuits about this, whether the legislature has the power and authority to control sections of a city and put in a criminal justice system for just part of the city. And what happens if you get caught in that neighborhood after hours? Uh, you can only imagine. And so it'll be interesting to see what the lawsuits are that will try to undo this. Um, the, so we talked about the Supreme Court, um, um, the Supreme Court uh, out of Wisconsin last night, uh, uh, Rebecca, and of course uh, Democrats uh, they uh, ran away with that Supreme Court position, ten year a ten year position, okay, ten year position, uh, and giving Democrats a four to three majority on the state Supreme Court. Now, many folks have talked about gerrymandering, political gerrymandering, abortion. Uh, and so uh, the, the woman who won, Janet uh, um, uh, she won last night. But check this out. She hasn't even been sworn in. And re look at this here. This is from uh, Bolt's Mag. Republican lawmakers have signaled that they will use their gerrymandered majorities to fight the court. Several Republicans said in the run-up to Tuesday, before she even won, they would consider impeaching her and removing her from office. The GOP needs a supermajority in the state Senate to pull off that move, and the resignation of a longtime Republican senator late last year left them one vote short. The special election to replace her was also held on Tuesday in a red-leaning district in the Milwaukee suburbs. The race had, been, had not been called as a publication, but Republican nominee Dan Noddle ha has a very small lead with a handful of precincts reigning. If his edge holds, it would give the GOP sufficient votes to impeach and remove public officials on party line votes. Such a move may be politically and constitutionally explosive, but Republicans' lawmakers may be largely insulated from electoral consequences as long as they head off any new judicially ordered maps that curb their power in the State House. Rebecca, I have said repeatedly to people over and over and over and over, these people care about power. They will exercise power any way they choose to do so. This is a craven attempt 
at his lustful power. There's no other, there, there's no other way um, to explain it, because what we're seeing across the country is very anti-democratic. My organization spent a lot of time on the ground. I'm in Wisconsin, going across college campuses, across Wisconsin, making sure that students understood you need to show up and vote. You are not just voting for your future, but you are voting for your present. If you care about how these maps are drawn, if you feel like you're being targeted and not being represented as a student because um, there is strong gerrymandering around your um, campus, if students don't understand that they are a community of interest and they have the right to have a fair and equal representation um, as other people, these were the type of issues that we let them know. We let them know if you care about abortion rights, if you care about other health care rights, um, if, you, um, if, if you care on um, all of the hurdles that you have to go through in order to even access the ballot box with voter registration, then we need you to turn out. And I'm so happy to see that students are turning out. I'm so happy to see that different communities that weren't expected to turn out in the record numbers that they did last night. I'm very enthusiastic that people are fighting back and they are t uh, that there is participation in democracy. But it's also saddening that across the country, not just in Wisconsin, not just in Jackson, that there is these repeated attacks that are happening over and over. We have to stay vigilant because it's going to be whack-a-mole from here um, through November 2024. But, but, but here's part of the problem, Robert, when we talk about, you know, voting. So let's go to, no let's go to North Carolina, go to my iPad. Uh, Trisha Cotham, uh, she is a, a Democrat in North Carolina, was elected, re-elected in November, uh, she decided to flip to the Republicans, Robert, giving them a supermajority. Now they have a supermajority in the state house. They, they were one vote short in the state Senate. She now gives them that vote, which now means they can override any veto uh, by the Democratic governor, Roy Cooper. Doesn't matter if he vetoes it, they got the votes to actually do it. Uh, and so she gave she gave this weird news conference explaining why she flipped. Oh, the Democratic Party left me. But what's crazy is that if you look at what she ran on, those are typically issues Democrats support. But here's a perfect example, though, of why I keep emphasizing on this show why we can't uh, uh, play uh, play around when it comes to these state races. Because again, when you allow the Republicans to have super majorities, it doesn't matter what Democrats do. They can run the table. North Carolina, same thing. When Sherry Beasley lost by 400 votes, Demo if she had won, Democrats could have had a six to one majority on the state Supreme Court, serving as a backstop to whatever the legislature could do. She loses, they had a four to three majority. Well, they lost the seat in 2022. Republicans now have a four to three majority there. So now by having super majorities, in the House and the Senate, they can override Democratic governor veto, and the state Supreme Court can go right along with them. Again, elections have consequences. Uh, well, you know, Roland, this uh, what the Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority, uh, where you have these institutions that uh, are built upon this idea that uh, by gerrymandering lines, by playing bully football uh, down in the paint, Republicans have been able to carve out uh, majorities across the country. And while Democrats were not paying attention to state and local races uh, pretty much from 2008 till uh, last year, Republicans were able to win over a thousand races uh, during the period of time that President Obama was in office, for example. Uh, they did this for this exact reason to redraw state lines, to change state voting laws, to control schools, control the educational system, to control uh, the, the police in cities and states. They know they cannot win on the federal level. They haven't won the popular vote since 2004 uh, in a presidential election, and that's the only time they've won since 1988. Uh, they, uh, the, 40, the 50 Republican senators represent 41 million fewer uh, individuals than the 50 Democratic senators, for, uh, for example. But because of this, they have concentrated on changing laws on the state and local level to ensure or they win. And you know what? Bravo to them. I hope that Democrats take this as a lesson. Stop playing patty cake, patty cake, baker man with these people. You have to play bully football with them just like they're playing bully football with you. When you have an opportunity, you take it. Stop trying to get the moral high ground. You have to win at all costs. And that's what Republicans are doing. And I hope Democrats can pick up on it before it's too late. Uh, going to a break, we come back. I'm going to tell you the latest is happening in Tennessee. Again, Republicans, they are showing what they do with power. They are moving to expel three Democrats, two African Americans, because they have the audacity to actually stand with people demanding gun control 
in Tennessee after six people, including, including three children, were shot and killed at a private Christian academy. All right, y'all can sit here and throw all kind of names you want, shield, whatever you want, but I'm telling you right now, all y'all who are watching, and y'all keep listening to all these yahoos out there uh, run their mouths, let me be perfectly clear. The Republican Party, they are exercising power, and they will flatten your black ass whether you vote or not. But go right ahead and keep telling me I'm the one who sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, if they control the state house, the state senate, governor's mansion, and a Supreme Court, and we're gonna see what's happening with the US Supreme Court, they can do what the hell they wanna do, and you can't do nothing about it. But keep sitting your ass there saying voting don't matter. I'll be right back. A lot of these corporations or people that are running stuff push black people if they're doing a certain thing. What that does is it creates a butterfly effect of any young kid who, you know, wants to leave any situation they're in, and the only people they see are people that are doing this, so I gotta be a gangster, I gotta shoot, I gotta sell, I gotta do this in order to do it, and it just becomes a cycle, but when someone comes around and is making other oh, money, we don't, money, you know, they don't wanna push it or put money into it, so that's definitely something I'm trying to fix, too, is just show up as other avenues. You don't gotta be a rapper, you don't gotta be a ball player, you can be a country singer, you can be an opera singer, you can be a damn whatever, you you know, showing the, the different avenues, and that is possible, and it's hard for people to realize it's possible until someone does. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network, every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. Hey, I'm Arnaz Jane. Hi, this is Cheryl Lee Ralph, and you are watching Roland Martin, unfiltered. I mean, could it be any other way? Really, it's Roland Martin. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, we talked about uh, what's happening in Mississippi, Wisconsin. Now let's talk about Tennessee. Uh, in Tennessee, a uh, lot of angry mothers and fathers uh, were ticked off when the Tennessee representatives in the committee voted to allow teachers to carry handguns. Watch this. There are children alive today that would be dead because of your attitudes. Teacher, I would never carry a gun to school. And I know how to use a gun and I own it. I would never carry a gun in front of my students. I loved my students. I would die for them, but I would not shoot them. I am so glad I'm back to Tennessee Educator. Now, there have been a consistent protest in Tennessee after. Six people were killed at that private Christian academy just a couple of weeks ago, including three children. Uh, thousands of protesters, especially a lot of young people, have been des descending upon the state capitol. Well, they have been, uh, they got some support from three Democrats on the floor of the Tennessee uh, House uh, who, when they were in the well, spoke of their behalf. Now, uh, the Republicans right there, this is the actual video. So the Republicans uh, then said that they uh, were, sp they spoke out of turn. Now the Republicans are moving to actually expel them from the legislature. 
That vote is going to take place tomorrow. Beginning at 9 a.m. Uh, tomorrow, they're going to begin the proceedings. Those three will be allowed to actually speak up. We had one of the representatives uh, on the show last night. Uh, this is a tweet from one of the other, one of the three. There were two African-American men, one white woman, uh, and this is Representative Gloria Johnson. She tweeted, I just had a visit from the head of HR and the House ethics lawyer. I appreciate them letting me know that if I am expelled, I will lose my health benefits. I also appreciate the ethics lawyer letting me know that in one case, a member who was potentially up for expulsion decided to resign. If you resign, you maintain your health benefits. And she goes, I appreciate that information. Heavens to Betsy, all this does not mean I am considering resigning, never. I am ready to have my hearing in the public view. Now, Robert, what's uh, hilarious here is that the, um, the House Speaker, the House Speaker uh, actually said uh, that uh, he is doing this I'm trying to find this interview. Uh, he's doing this because um, he said that, oh, they were going to, the three of them, they were going to, uh, they were inciting violence as a result of the action. H here's the problem. Uh, this is the headline from News Channel 5. House Speaker calls for expulsion of three Democrats but can't prove claims of violence. So, Robert, he says, oh, they were going to incite violence. We got to kick him out. But he has no proof. Well, you know, this is the thing. These are the same people that if you told, tell them or show them videos of the insurrection, they'll say there was no insurrection. It was just a tourist visit. These people were showing reverence to the Capitol. They weren't trying to overthrow the government. They were just there to show their support and exercise their First Amendment rights. But then, as soon as people are speaking up and saying, well, maybe we shouldn't have 80-year-old language arts teachers uh, carrying a 45 trying to shoot a 16-year-old school shooter, maybe that will make things worse uh, in some of these situations. Uh, they are uh, using this as a justification to try to expel them from the House of Representatives. But as I said before, this is bully -ball. This is the way the Republicans do politics now. And then we look at the way the Democrats did those January 6th hearings, not uh, focusing in on Hawley and what he did to incite the insurrection, not focusing on Ted Cruz and what he did, not focusing on Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and some of the other in the MAGA caucus. They should have been trying to expel them from Congress. But they don't play ball the same way these other people play ball. This is the way that you exert power. This is Machiavellianism uh, at its uh, highest level. And we have to understand that if you are uh, sitting here playing uh, slow pitch softball and they're, uh, they're playing fast pitch, you're going to continue to lose. Democrats have to uh, pick up on what the game is and play it the same way they are. Uh, so check this out. Go back to my iPad, please. So the House Speaker, uh, when he was questioned, uh, he goes, uh, they, they're the ones that, that has done something that's never happened. And they are the ones that pull out a megaphone on the House floor and led the protest to the gallery, which shut us down. This is the House Speaker of Tennessee, y'all. Okay, so check this out. He was asked, what is your opinion? Should they be expelled? My opinion is they should be expelled. Now check this out. He says, they did in the chamber with other members break every rule that we almost have, blah, 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 blah. He then goes on to say they were trying to incite violence. When News Channel 5 asked him, there's no doubt they were disruptive, but what's the evidence that they were trying to incite violence? He goes, well, they were trying to jazz people up. They said, but incite violence? He goes, when we had res representatives go to the restroom, they got spit on. They still said, do you have any evidence that these three members were encouraging protesters to spit on members or troopers? The Speaker of the House, I mean, you can't prove that. But he goes on talk radio and says, what they did today was equivalent, at least equivalent, maybe worse, depending on how you look at it, of doing an insurrection in the Capitol. Give me a damn break, Rebecca. <laughs> The only violence that was going on was the gun violence that um, we just witnessed in Nashville. What you see is you have uh, members of the opposition party 
who refuse to be held accountable, and when you have three representatives actually using the bully pulpit of what that House floor is for to actually bring up relevant issues that their constituents care about and that their constituents want to see action uh, from the Tennessee House on, instead you see that they're shut down and that they're being threatened um, to either resign or coerce into resigning over health care benefits, or there, uh, or there's going to be a vote tomorrow. Um, I just say this: um, my organization stands with Justin. We represented him about eight years ago um, as he was fighting um, to keep voting rights um, for young people um, in Tennessee. Um, you know, this is going to backfire. Because at the end of the day, a lot of people are watching what's going on, and this is actually going to motivate people to not just register the vote and to turn out to vote, but actually showing up um, to hearings, showing up to community events, because people are tired of this. It's like, take your thumb off the scale. You know, I, I, I don't know if it's going to cause that, Scott. I, I, I don't. I mean, here's the deal. Um, Tennessee is a red state. I would hope these white conservative mothers and fathers are realizing what's going on and say, this makes no sense. Look, the Republicans in Tennessee carved up the city of Nashville into multiple congressional districts because they did not want there to be a Democrat representative in Congress. So they had an eight to two majority in Congress. Now it's nine to one. Uh, the only person is Steve Cohen in Memphis. Um, so a couple things. One, if you look at that video, that's a peaceful protest. You know, the uh, U.S. Congress, the Democrats, several years ago, protested in the chambers and sat out and wouldn't move and locked arms. You have a bully uh, a bullhorn. You have someone there holding up a sign. You have members taking pictures, walking freely throughout the chamber. In fact, they're walking up to the speaker. They may not like it. The supporters are up at the top yelling and screaming. But this is a peaceful protest. You may not like their messaging, but they got a message, if you will. And to throw them out for that, and you've got security there, this isn't some melee. And so this is democracy at its best, exercising their First Amendment, if you will. The process for uh, uh, putting them out of Congress or the State House is um, maybe driven by politics. But that's why you have the judiciary, if you will. If this goes through, there are no punches being thrown. There's no one being kicked. There's no one fighting. There's no one even making any gesture towards even throwing any punch. You've got to appeal this if they throw it out to the, either the state house, I'm sorry, the state court, or even federal court for violation of their constitutional rights here. The speaker's got to know he's on dangerous ground here. Because you have a chilling effect on the First Amendment and democracy here. And these, the, the optics of this is at least two of them, maybe three of them, are black folks. They could file a discrimination suit against the speaker and the body itself. And so I think he's asking for more problems than this is a solution. He may not like the decorum, if you will, but protest and change is never easy. It, power can seize nothing without a struggle. It never has, and it never will. And they're not conceding what they're protesting in these chambers, if you will. And so I think the speaker needs to take a long, hard look at that, because I, I could make an argument that it's race-based as well as violating their First Amendment. But they do not care, Robert. Uh, absolutely. And this is what I mean by playing bully ball down here in the in the trenches, because you can criticize them. You can try to embarrass them. You can talk bad about them. You can say how they're working against the Constitution. They are fighting against the fundamental principles of democracy. They are uh, right. going against the Western uh, uh, conventions of, uh, of the popular vote and doing the will of the people. They don't give a damn about any of that. What they care about is power. What they care about is ensuring that they can maintain their way of life, maintain their hegemony. When it comes to American politics and Amer uh, the American populace, which they no longer have a demographical advantage when it comes to. We see this in state after state. How many times they got to hit you over the head before you realize y'all are no longer sparring, that they are trying to punch for real? Uh, it is one thing when you're both in the ring, you're saying, well, we'll, put, we'll have the soft gloves on and the, the helmets and the headgear and stuff. And it's another thing when they're pulling out brass knuckles and punching you, and you're still doing the same thing over and over again. When you see these people, they are fighting tooth and nail. They're using every 
legislative tactic that is known to man in order to be able to exert total power and domination. That is their name of the game. It's no longer compromise. It's no longer bipartisanism. It's about domination, and you have to start playing on the same playing field. Well, uh, look, I wrote my book, yeah, White. Roland. Yeah. Yeah, Roland, uh, uh, Robert raises another point, a really good point. He didn't spend a lot of time on it. But by expelling these members, if it happens, is removing the will of the voters, if you will. These people were properly elected, and you are eliminating elected officials, thereby violating the will of the people and the cost to replace them and the cost of litigation that the state has got to be and have to pay for. And so it's going to get really expensive by doing this, acting badly and violating any traditional notions of democracy. And so it's going to be an expensive proposition, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want well, people... Uh, Re Re Rebecca, go ahead. I was also going to say, what happened to the rest of the Democratic caucus? If they also would have got up and joined in that protest, what is the Speaker of the House going to do? Kick all of them out? Put all of them up for a vote of expulsion? If one do, then all need to do. All of them need to stand up, because this simply cannot be allowed to happen. And to Robert's point, we can't just speak highbrow, like, oh, this is a front to democracy, but actually do something. Now is the moment to do something, because if this is allowed, it's going to be a long 18 months. Yeah, but you know, the, well, well, but the well, 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 that, well, that, well, that, well, <laughs> They need some political gangsters at the federal mm -hmm. level and state level. But, but again, though, hold, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up again. Uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow. The question is tomorrow, will Democrats do what you said, Rebecca? All right, folks, got to go to a break. Uh, we'll be back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Don't forget to download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Uh, support us in what we do. Join the Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, senior dollars, uh, chicken money orders, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196, cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered, Venmo, RM Unfiltered, Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Be sure to get your copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Bookstores everywhere, including Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Target. You can also get your copy on Audible. We'll be right back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, you're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Coming up on the next Black Tape, a conversation with Professor Howard W. French on his new book, Born in Blackness, covering 600 years of global African history and helping us understand how the world we know today is a gift from black people. There could have been no West without Africa and Africa. That's on the next Black Table with me, Greg Carr, only on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Bishop T.D. James. Hi, I'm doing it's your favorite funny girl, Amanda Seals. Hi, I'm Anthony Brown from Anthony Brown and Group Therapy. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs>
Folks, Brandon Johnson is the next mayor of Chicago. He beats Paul Vallis to become the 57th mayor of the city of Chicago, the third African-American elected mayor. Of course, uh, he uh, beat him by about 16,000 votes. Of course, uh, Vallis had the support of Fraternal Order Police. Uh, you have uh, Johnson, a former Chicago Teachers Union organizer. Uh, this is what he said last night at his victory party. <laughs> You know, they said this would never happen. So, you know, if they didn't know, now they know. <laughs> There's so many people who are responsible for this moment. And I'd like to thank and take a second to thank those individuals. You know, but first, I want to make sure that I say this. The first thing that I want to say is to the Chicagoans who did not vote for me. Here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to know. That I care about you. I value you. And I want to hear from you. I want to work with you. And I'll be the mayor for you, too. Yeah! Because this campaign has always been about building a better, stronger, safer Chicago for all the people of Chicago. And when I say all the people, I mean all the people, especially folks, especially folks, who have ever been on a payment plan. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so from Lincoln Park to Humble Park, from Jefferson Park to Garfield Park, there are so many people that made this possible. Uh, of course, uh, uh, let me see if I can find this. Paul Vallis uh, tweeted out, uh, you know, his concession. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know what? Uh, remember, Paul Vallis uh, couldn't find time uh, to come do Roller Martin Unfiltered. Uh, Brandon Johnson was smart to do our show on three different occasions. Uh, but um, there we go. Uh, and so uh, this is the tweet that he sent out last night. Uh, I called Brandon Johnson uh, a short time ago to congratulate him on winning this election. It's critically important that we all come together now and work collaboratively to move our city forward. I thank my supporters and team and especially my family. Thank you, Chicago. Um, what's interesting here, uh, Rebecca, uh, again, what Johnson, this was, a, you know, a, a little known county commissioner, uh, he runs was what, one, two percent in the polls when this thing started. But what he did was he organized on the ground, neighborhood by neighborhood, precinct by precinct, block by block, street by street, house by house. That's how you win. That's the blueprint. He's also a um, former teacher. He knocked on doors. He showed up in communities. He didn't just rely on big names. He didn't get the endorsement of Senator um, Dick Durbin. Instead, he was able to get the endorsement of people in the community, um, different community leaders, um, different ward leaders. And he spoke about things that everyday uh, folks in Chicago are going through, and he was authentic. The bottom line is people are tired of politicians being all all pretty and shiny. Instead, they want someone who's speaking to the issues and the things that they're going through in their everyday life. And uh, Mayor like Johnson did just that, and that's why he is the um, new mayor of Chicago. Um, uh, Robert, it's a whole bunch of black political leaders in Chicago with egg on their face, uh, they stood with Paul Vallis, uh, folks like um, former Congressman Bobby Rush, uh, uh, Emile Jones, who was the former Illinois Senate president, uh, a number of black aldermen uh, and others. A lot of them were in the Vallis campaign. Now they're on the outside looking in. 
<laughs> well, you know, this happens every election cycle. The young insurgent isn't believed in. If you remember, this happened to uh, President Obama when he was uh, first running. Everybody endorsed Hillary, uh, including Andrew Young and the civil rights leadership class, and they uh, and eventually you make it back up. But I think it's important to what Rebecca just said, the fact that this was a grassroots-driven campaign, a, a campaign about the people, a campaign about the issues, not a campaign that is driven by the person who has the most money in their pockets because many of our elections have turned into auctions, uh, but a campaign driven by someone who had a genuine connection and a love for the city that they are representing. And I find it interesting that a few years ago, you know, we, we kind of have this wave of black girl magic mayors, that I call them around the country, Keisha Lance Bottoms, Mayor Bowser, Mayor Contrell, Mayor Lightfoot, uh, on down the line across the country. And now it seems that we're having a wave of, I guess, the black boy joy mayors, uh, whether it's Brandon Scott in Baltimore, uh, Andre Dickens in Atlanta now, uh, Mayor Adams in New York, and now uh, Brandon Johnson in Chicago. I, I want to, uh, to see how the, um, the traditional power structures react to them, and that they will be treated with more respect or dignity than their sisters were when they were in very similar positions. Because if we remember, part of what made it so difficult for many of the black female mayors were continuous battles with the police departments and the police unions, continuous battles with the uh, education sector, continuous battles with the construction uh, sector and with the developers that uh, made it very difficult for them to uh, push for their agenda. I, I just, as a political science uh, uh, aspect of it, I am interested to, interested to see if we have a different outcome now that we're seeing a different wave of uh, mayors taking the country. But shout out to Mayor Brandon, we were, or, or, or to uh, Mayor Johnson. We uh, looking forward to seeing everything that he can do for that city and all the needs of the people, not just on the north side, but on the south side, west side, and everywhere else. Uh, well, he's from the west side, so trust me, uh, they will be looked after. West Hold tight one second. Uh, I'm going to come back. We're going to pick up on this, uh, uh, and uh, we'll talk about again what happens when you can be a strong progressive and still be a, what, centrist? Somebody who's they call Closet Republican and Paul Vallis. We'll talk more about that on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, re-entry anxiety. A lot of us are having trouble transitioning in this post-pandemic society and don't even realize it. We are literally stuck between two worlds in purgatory. How to get out of purgatory and regain your footing and balance. What emotions they're feeling and being able to label them because as soon as you label an emotion, it's easier to self-regulate. It's easier to manage that emotion. The next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, we're talking about the difficulty of being able to acquire wealth for Black Americans. My guest, Emily Flitter, is the author of The White Wall, How Big Finance is Bankrupting Black America. The bad stuff that you feel when you're dealing with the financial services industry is not your fault. It's not your fault and you don't deserve to be treated like this. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Vivian Green. Hi, I'm Wendell Pierce, actor and author of The Wind in the Reeds. Hey, yo, Peace World, what's going on? It's the love king of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. We're still talking about Chicago and the election of Brandon Johnson. One of the things that um, uh, many people, they tried to label him with a socialist tag. They felt that he did not have the right economic policy. Uh, clearly, uh, the voters there uh, said they like what they heard. But something else that I think is important that we have to look at, Scott, and that is 
here was somebody they tried to tag with defund the police, but he kept saying, we have to reimagine public safety. Uh, and he stuck with that message. He did not allow them to tag him with that, uh, but he did stick with his convictions when it came to looking at the issue of public safety from a, in a different way. He did, and his victory is even more powerful and really interesting. Chicago is a very segregated city. It always has been. I was born in Chicago, raised in a suburb of Joliet, but it's been ethnically segregated, economically segregated, and crime was a big issue, and the teachers and public education were big issues in this campaign. It's a divided city. Everyone wanted to unify the city. So, so his victory, given where he came from, is really incredible. But more importantly, he had the resources on the ground. He was endorsed by the SEIU and the teachers' union, right? And so, as a result, he was able to organize, since he's a fundamental organizer, and, and eventually he got in the runoff. He wasn't even supposed to be in the runoff. That was going to be Lori Lightfoot and um, the, the guy he, he beat. And so this is just really incredible. You can be a progressive, you can be a reasonable progressive, but if you've got the organization and the bodies behind you, people vote. All you have to do before you govern is get elected. You got to get one more vote than the next guy. And he and those union members really understood that. He's got an incredible smile. He's very charismatic. You're charismatic. And you know what? He reminds you of another former mayor, the first uh, black mayor of Chicago, Harold Washington. There's a movie out put out uh, by a frat brother of mine, Hassan Lambert, called Punch Nine. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's the incredible story and biography of Harold Washington. Brandon Johnson reminds you of him. He's got challenges ahead, though, because those who supported him, like the teachers' union, their contracts are going to be coming up. And secondly, the voters have spoken. Can he bring both sides together or three or four sides together and manage that coalition that got him elected? Blacks, whites, gays, uh, union members, and working class people, hard to manage that constituency while you lead and govern. We'll see. Rebecca, I, I think it's important, though, that, again, we, we have to understand that, yeah, you can actually be a progressive and win. You don't have to, this whole deal, run to the center uh, and all different things along those lines. Uh, I mean, look, he, beat, he didn't have the support of the fraternal or the police. He didn't need it. Right, right. Be authentic. Be responsive to the things that people are going through. Um, it's really interesting that Mayor Lori Lightfoot had tweeted out that he would never become mayor. But now we see that he is going to become mayor because he's being responsive. Like, one of the criticisms with her is that she wasn't responsive to people and that she, too, was, all, you know, she ran as a progressive but then governed as a centrist. Um, I think that um, Mayor Johnson, uh, Mayor Lake Johnson, is going to be just fine um, with the, the unique coalition that that he was able to pull together. It was basically everybody in Chicago, but a lot of white people. That's really what his coalition was. And it's representative of what Chicago is. So as long as he stays authentic, as long as he shows up in neighborhoods, the very neighborhoods that um, voted for him, if he keeps doing those things, keep doing outreach, keep looking for ways of bringing more people into the political system, I think he's going to be just fine. But... It also shows that there is a blueprint with talking about reimagining public safety. And there's one thing that we even need the White House to understand. There has to be a serious conversation about police, mm -hmm. reform, police reform, about public safety. And this White House right now is not saying, like, oh, well, we can't quite talk about that because it's going to hurt our chances at the ballot. We saw last night that you can talk about it. You can be authentic. You don't have to kowtow to a particular union that's not interested in reform, that's not interested in policies that actually keep the black community be safe from law enforcement and with law enforcement, but you can actually talk about it in a way that people understand it and they will vote for you. Well, it's interesting, uh, it's interesting Robert, because you even had uh, the head of Eternal Order Police claim that, oh, if Brandon Johnson is elected, 800 to 1,000 cops are going to quit their job. Okay.
when they need it. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, to Rebecca's point, this on the federal level seems to be the perfect time uh, to work on police reform. The, the reason being is we have this odd place where the enemy of my enemy is my friend, where you have a lot of conservatives now saying that, well, we have to uh, reform policing, reform law enforcement, reform prosecutorial discretion, uh, because they're going after Trump and going after this, that, and the other. Fine. We can make a compromise bill that we will uh, protect your uh, your folks. You compromise and say that, well, we'll put in the type of police reform necessary that people have been uh, marching for and protesting for for years to stop the abuse and the genocide of black men in this country. It seems like a good time to bring the subject matter up because we see that the term defund the police is not as toxic as it used to be. We've now had two plus years to explain exactly what people mean by that. And people understand that it's not about taking resources away from policing. It's about ensuring that we are the deploying the resources as best possible to ensure that we're getting the best outcomes when it comes to both public safety and the rights of individuals, that you should not have a police officer in a full uniform of a gun, a badge, a taser, a stick, handcuffs, uh, and, uh, uh, and a loaded weapon to patrol a high school hallway, for example. Uh, and that now that people understand that better, then just these Republican tropes of just simply throwing out defund the police are no longer effective, and we can get the type of reform necessary through, but we have to have people with the courage and the gumption who are willing to, as I said earlier, play bully ball and bully politics to get it done. And if we don't seem to have that type of gumption, or as Scott said, have those kinds of gangsters, those thugs, those goons on our side, they're willing to push that agenda through. Uh, well, Scott, I, again, I, I think that, um, you know, we talk a lot about, and I, I get asked this question all the time, people around the country, like, well, you know, how do we make these things happen? And, and, and I keep trying to explain to people, I say, guys, it's basic math. If you get one more vote than your other person, you win. And, and the thing is, there's a way to get there. And the way to get there is you have to work to get it. You have to invest on the ground. Uh, Brandon Johnson was outgunned financially by Vallis. He did, though. He had those ground troops from the teachers' union. They went door to door. That's what, what, what gets it done. And, and I've been saying this, and some people have been upset with me, and I don't give a damn. And I've been saying, black folks, don't send money. Uh, 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 when we start talking about these congressional races next year and the presidential race, don't send money to the DNC. Don't send money to the candidates. Send that money to black third party groups because they are going to be the ones to go beat the bushes and go door to door. That's the only way we win. It's aggressive ground game. It ain't listening to these white consultants who are taking down millions by dumping all the money on television, Scott. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? If you don't have that ground game, or better yet, if you don't believe in that philosophy, right, if you campaign based on how you would govern, then you're going to lose in most jurisdictions, in most parts of this country. I mean, it's about touching voters. It's about being earnest. It's about them believing that you're going to make a difference in their life, that you understand, appreciate, and can sympathize or even empathize with those, those, those table issues, if you will, those uh, breakfast table issues. And then more importantly, making smart decisions during the campaign, not overspending, but, but going after votes and counting your votes. Mayor Barry used to say, by a week to three days before the, the actual election, you should know whether you're going to win or lose or not. Because everybody you've touched and your people's to people have touched, you should have a car. Those are your voters. That's where you send the buses and what have you. And if you're not organized like that, he used to say there's a reason why they call it political science. Because it's a science to getting elected, to getting people to vote for you and getting them to the polls. And it never stops being that. It could be 1800 or it could be 2023. It, the same formula is you got to get one more vote than the next guy and count your votes at every precinct. Bottom line, and it never stops being that. Uh, Rebecca, uh, you were agreeing with that again. It's ground game, ground game, ground game. And I would rather dump money into a ground game than a bunch of damn ads on television. Yeah. Right. People yeah. think that, okay, we could just run a bunch of um, political ads on TV or we could do a bunch of direct mail. 
But for the biggest voting block in this country, which are the millennials, also are um, the Gen Zers, it is, it's not television. They're not watching television. Even Gen Xers aren't watching television. They're watching, they're using OTT um, um, apl applications um, instead of watching traditional like cable. The, like this show. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, using different apps to stream, using YouTube um, to get their content. So instead, you have to go back to the old-fashioned organizing, which is relational organizing. That's a new name for it. What does it mean? You have to get out on the streets where the people are, and you have to talk to the people directly. You have to be authentic. You have to use different groups of people who are connected to that community. You can't just fly in people from all over the country to converge into a city, into a town, into a neighborhood, but you actually have to deploy people who are from that town, from that neighborhood, and you have to listen to people, because different communities and the different Black communities across this country, they'll tell you, we'll tell people this is how we want to be organized and like you said the different um, national political committees do not always listen they rely on different folks and a, a lot of white consultants who don't have the shared experience of what it means to be black in this country so that means that's not the lens or the worldview that they're using as they're reaching into different black communities and that's why you don't see black folks turning out because there isn't the right amount of resources being put into the turnout effort. Um, they're not talking to uh, folks. We, we should, these groups should be talking to people now. We are, what, 19, 20 months until um, the yep. November 2024 yep. election. Now is the time to take the streets, to knock on doors, see what everyday people are going through, and figuring out how to pull them into the system. And that was one of the things, the work. and that was one of the things, Robert, we've talked about here as well. Look, you better be engaged in a massive education campaign now, explaining to people what you did. Having small town halls, having gatherings. Don't just, again, uh, wait until the absolute last minute. No, it, I keep saying, enlighten, educate, register, then vote. You know, I, I don't know what it is, but for some reason, Democrats have just decided they are going to give up on the political communications game, give up on the political organizing game, and give up on actually trying to get their own people out to vote. They are obsessed with this idea that you're going to get those Rust Belt voters from Iowa uh, Iowa and Ohio and uh, Buffalo, New York, and Scranton to come back to the Democratic Party uh, instead of actually organizing where your voters are at. Uh, we see what the Republicans are doing already uh, heading into 2024. They're already midway through their campaign season. And Democrats are still trying to figure out what they're going to do going forward. They've already drawn their battle lines. They've decided they're going to run on the culture war. They're going to want, run on, quote unquote, wokeism. Uh, they're going to run on transgender issues and uh, the persecution of white people in this country. Uh, they're going to run on white victimization uh, as a uh, political punching bag and the uh, indictment and uh, persecution of Trump, for example. So what are Democrats doing to counter this? Is President Biden sending somebody out to roll martyr and filter to talk about about President, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's trip to Africa last week? Doesn't that seem like something that's simple to do? You're down the damn street. Send somebody over to talk about what you did in Africa to the black people. Right. It's not magic that we're talking about. Uh, don't you think so much, uh, from the national security uh, uh, side of the Biden uh, White House, so we talk about with Secretary Blinken negotiate with the Philippines to expand the U.S. military president in the South China Sea? Doesn't that seem like something people should know about? And why were well, you keeping it to yourself? Do you think you, uh, you're going to pop it out at the last minute? These people do not understand what it takes to win, and they're taking things that should be a runaway, and they're turning into close races because they do not want to play, as I've said throughout the show, the type of bully ball necessary to win these races. And because of that, they will continue to lose because in their minds, they would rather still have proximity to white supremacy than to actually give power over and turn power over to black and brown people who are actually the driving force behind the party. Hold tight one second. We come back and we're going to talk about how Republicans are now targeting college students and college campuses. I only warned our civil rights groups about this, oh, 12, 14 years ago. We'll unpack that. Plus, we'll salute, we'll show you how Bowie State University is honoring Dion Warwick. That is next on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Side Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. 
an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye bye, Papa. We feel the hidden impacts of climate change that land harder in black, brown, and native communities. Not many people talk about it because they clearly don't know our lives. But with President Biden's landmark infrastructure and climate plans, our issues are finally seen. Removing lead pipes means we know our water is safe. Cutting carbon pollution helps our kids breathe easier. 1.5 million new jobs mean stable work in communities. The impact we need. Right now. What's up, y'all? I'm Will Packer. Hey, everybody, it's your man, Fred Hammond. Hi, my name is Brisha Webb, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Ow. Well, I like a nice filter usually, but we can be unfiltered. Folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Um, I remember I was moderating a panel at Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, ALC. This probably, my goodness, it was 2012, maybe it was 2014. I think, I think it was like probably 12, okay? And um, it was a panel uh, convened by Congresswoman Terry Sewell. Um, and I remember uh, Michelle and Eiffel was on at NAACP Legal Defense Fund. I remember um, Christian Clark, Lawyers, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. I was Secretary of State for California and Vanina Gupta, uh, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. They were on the panel and uh, we were talking about, uh, we they were talking about voter suppression and voting rights. And, and I said something to them then, I said, hey, I said, we have to stop framing what's going on solely through the prism of black and brown voters, this idea of voter suppression and what Republicans are doing. Now, why did I say that? I said that, and I, and I said then, I said because they are targeting these young white voters. These young white voters are increasingly voting Democratic. Um, in the 2012 election, Obama and Romney, uh, that was a white Wisconsin election clerk who admitted that she moved an early voting location off of a college campus to somewhere, you know, far out because she said too many young voters are voting Democrat. She literally said that. Uh, 2022, what happens? Uh, the Dobbs decision, huge young voters in Indiana, many other college campuses were turning out in huge numbers. And guess what? They were supporting Democratic candidates. Well, Republicans, I told y'all how they play. They said, oh, hell no, we ain't having that. So they have now been targeting college campuses. You've got a bill in Texas where they want to bar early voting locations on any campus, 8,000 or more students. Hmm. Wonder who they're targeting. Texas A&M, University of Texas. University of Houston, Texas Tech, the state's largest universities. This is the New York Times. First of all, it's a trash headline from the New York Times. I mean, it's, it's, it's just utterly trash headline. Uh, but I, I'll go ahead and, and talk about it. Republicans face setbacks and push to tighten voting laws on college campuses. Party officials across the country have sought to erect more barriers for young voters who tilt heavily Democratic after several cycles in which their turnout surged. The reason why this is important, uh, Rebecca, is because they see what is coming. The reality is the Republican Party, let me be perfectly clear, 
Republican Party is the party of old white people. And that's who supports them, that's who backs them, and they, they see they're losing, losing young voters, and they want to make it hard. That's why they are trying to get rid of ballot drop boxes, because Republicans are on record, Rebecca. They are on record in, across the country. If more people vote, we lose. Yeah. So those campuses in Texas that you just named are all campuses that we have partnerships with, and we do work to make sure that students have the opportunity to, to vote. Here's the thing. It's the law. And the Higher Education Act of, what, 1983, 1984, it says any um, higher—any uh, uh, college campus, whether it's community college, HBCU, minority-serving institution, a predominantly white institution, if it receives federal funds, it's supposed to let its students know when there is an opportunity to vote. And they also need to provide information on how to register to vote. And that's just something that we're seeing an opposition party in this country. They simply do not like. Because the thing that we notice is that when students turn out to vote, they are voting for progressive candidates. They're voting for progressive policies. The reason why they're doing that is because they're seeing the political rhetoric um, and they're also understanding the unfairness of going after um, abortion rights, the unfairness of, of gerrymandering based upon race. Race, the unfairness of um, targeting folks who are low income. And so students don't like that. And so that's what we're seeing. The Republican Party right now are going after people who would vote against Republican interests. And my thing is, like, my organization is a nonpartisan organization. We want people to turn out to vote. We want them to participate in our process. I would say for any political organization, um, any political party, if you don't feel like people are voting for you, then maybe you need to look inside and figure out what's going on. And maybe you need to understand that you are not representing the people that are out there um, right now. And maybe you need to reevaluate your platform. Um, we've been running this ad beginning on Monday that deals with the issue of climate change. Uh, and guys, go ahead and play it because this, this, this right here, Scott, is one of the issues. This is one of the issues that Republicans, uh, guys, hold on, hold on. No, cue it up. I'll tell you when to play it. This is one of the, this is one of the issues that appeal to young voters that they absolutely are against but it, is, it has been gaining traction. Press play. We feel the hidden impacts of climate change that land harder in black, brown, and native communities. Not many people talk about it because they clearly don't know our lives. But with President Biden's landmark infrastructure and climate plans, our issues are finally seen. Removing lead pipes means we know our water is safe. Cutting carbon pollution helps our kids breathe easier. 1.5 million new jobs mean stable work in communities. The impact we need right now. This right here, Scott, that's why they want to they shut it down. It's not just abortion. It's climate. It's also their constant attack on woke, woke, woke. Well, guess what? Uh, there's a bunch of white kids who are out there after the death of George Floyd. The reason you're seeing the changes, the, this, the, the changing view when it comes to criminal justice reform and police reform, because white Young white voters are waking up to reality. Yeah, absolutely. And that ad that you just ran has a direct relationship with the health disparity factors in the black communities. It is directly related to climate change or our current environmental concerns where poor people, disenfranchised people, and people of color, black, brown, and red, are living in conditions where Railroad tracks are running through poor communities, if you will, where pollution, I guess it was 56 percent more. And listen, I'm not surprised young white folks are waking up and saying, you know, we want the George Floyd uh, Justice Act or that we want a clean environment. We want to save uh, climate change, if you will. We want to be attuned to that. Uh, and we want uh, free abortions or abortion on demand, because this is the right thing to do as part of the human condition and our freedoms in this country. Listen, I've said it before, and I think, Roland, you've said this too. White people, I mean, I mean the GOP, they do all of these things of voter suppression uh, at all levels, because if people vote, they can't, they, the GOP can't win, because they're the party of no, they're the party of negative. They're the party of guns. They're the party of pro-life. 
but they don't want to take care of all these babies once they're born. They, they, they don't have any policies or platforms that are attractive to people who are living day-to-day -day lives. It's all culture war. It's all misdirection. It's all divisiveness and getting folks to fight each other. It's all based on racism. If you want to fix the immigration problem, the Republicans have been in office, Democrats in office, they can get together with the Democrats and figure that part out. They don't want to because it's a political divisive issue. They can only win if they divide. And the problem now is that black and brown people aren't going to the Republican Party. They're staying with the Democratic Party or independent. And now you're left with these young white folks. White people aren't having as many kids. And so they're losing. It's all really connected. And so I'm not surprised that uh, the GOP isn't, is targeting young people, but they don't have a message or a platform that's going to sell because of, of, of the, the, uh, the Republican policies or whatever you would call them, the Republican points. Uh, final, final point here. Um, this is why, and I will say, Rebecca, I'll let you have the last word on this one. This is why I say this over and over and over again. Young voters, you must vote your numbers. I'm tired of, I don't want to hear a millennial or a Gen Z talk about, oh, uh, these baby boomers and these Gen X. If you vote your numbers, you run the table. Yep, absolutely. Rebecca? That's absolutely right. When we think about millennials, millennials now are in their early 40s. When we think about Gen Zers, they're um, about 24, 24 and younger. And if those two blocks of voters show up, there is so much change that will happen in this country. And you're right. It's not just about abortion. Um, it's not just about voting rights. It's about, um, climate, it's about climate. It's about the environment. It's about safe drinking water. It's about being able to live your life and not be burdened down with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. It's about actually being able to afford to have a mortgage. It's about actually having a, a car, a basic car that doesn't cost $50,000. And so those are the things that young people, those are the things that those who are under 42, 41 care about, um, but we do need them to show up. If you show up, like just being mad about TikTok, be mad about TikTok that there are states and Congress is thinking about banning TikTok, but hold on to that anger more than just two minutes. Actually hold on to it, actually show up and vote. If young people vote, we wouldn't have um, politicians like Donald Trump if young people voted in the numbers um, that they could command. All right, folks, uh, hold tight one second. When we come back, we'll hear from uh, attorney Ben Crump, who will also uh, show you how Bowie State is honoring the legend Dionne Warren. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what we do. Uh, check and money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash out, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. A lot of these corporations or people that are running stuff push black people if they're doing a certain thing. What that does is it creates a butterfly effect of any young kid who, you know, wants to leave any situation they're in, and the only people they see are people that are doing this, so I gotta be a gangster, I gotta shoot, I gotta sell, I gotta do this in order to do it, and it just becomes a cycle, but when someone comes around and is making other, oh, we don't, you know, they don't wanna push it or put money into it, so that's definitely something I'm trying to fix, too, is just show there's other avenues. You don't gotta be a rapper, you don't gotta be a ball player, you can be a country singer, you can be an opera singer, you can be a damn whatever, you know? Know, showing the, the different avenues, and that is possible, and it's hard for people to realize it's possible until someone does it. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, re-entry anxiety. A lot of us are having trouble transitioning in this post-pandemic society and don't even realize it. We are literally stuck between two worlds in purgatory. 
how to get out of purgatory and regain your footing and balance. What emotions they're feeling and being able to label them because as soon as you label an emotion, it's easier to self-regulate. It's easier to manage that emotion. The next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. Hello, everyone. It's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And we're at SWV. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Virginia medical examiner says a black man who died at a mental hospital was murdered. That's right. Uh, the administrative, uh, first of all, according to the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, uh, the autopsy uh, of uh, this black man, folks, uh, shows he was asphyxiated. That's right. Basically, based upon them kneeling on him. Positional and mechanical asphyxia with restraints. We've seen the video. We had his family on the show as well. Joining us right now is the family's attorney, uh, Ben Crump. Ben, um, look, these officers have been charged. Uh, guess what? Let's see the, them now try to explain this away, this uh, report from the autopsy. Yeah, this was an important announcement, Roland Martin. Uh, the fact that it was ruled a homicide, that he didn't die of natural causes, they didn't find any, you know, uh, illegal substances in his system. So what killed him was what we saw in that video, Roland Martin, uh, an ex overdose of excessive force where they literally smothered Ivo Otenio to death. This brother from Kenya who was having a mental health crisis hadn't committed any crime. And so, uh, again, we saw, again, eight, ten people uh, on top of him. Uh, and just, I mean, utterly nonsensical, uh, if you will, uh, their actions. And um, it's just, it's just, again, it's just a shame that we literally are sitting here having this conversation. Uh, you know, what they did to him was still shocking and stunning. And then this report says this was murder. This was homicide. Yeah, and, you know, Roland, two things. Number one, the brother, as Scott Bolden would know so well, was in restraint on his handcuffs, and he had leg irons on, and he was face down. So why 10 people needed to pile on top of him at times putting that knee in his back and on his neck three years after George Floyd makes no sense whatsoever. But what we would imagine, all of them are going to start pointing fingers at each other. It wasn't me, it was them. And that's why this announcement by the medical examiner was so very important, because she said that the man in cause of death was homicide by positional and mechanical asphyxia, which meant that he died from suffocation and now all we have to do is make sure that the prosecutor is zealous in her prosecution of these law enforcement officers, because oftentimes they go easy when it's police killing unarmed black people like we have with Ivo. So we have to keep covering this matter. And thank you. With all the coverage going to the former president, you, Roland Martin, keep covering issues that are important to our communities. Well, I'm not spending a lot of time talking about that uh, because, again, we do have a lot of issues that come up uh, that don't get the coverage that, that, it, that it definitely needs. Uh, let's go to my panel for questions. I'll start with you, Scott. Scott, your questions for Ben Crump. Hey, Ben, good, good hearing from you again under very bad circumstances. The one thing that struck me about the video is these are small guys. These are big, beefy cops and hospital staff who are on top of this guy. And it begs the question, notwithstanding the restraints, you know, the victim, how big was the victim? Because in pictures of him that you can see, 
seem to see that he's about five, ten, six foot, but a thin build. Can you confirm that? Yeah, he weighed around 200 pounds or so. And the question okay. that I know good lawyers like you, Scott Bowden and Monique Presley, what we're going to ask to all of them, he's face down, handcuffed, and shackled. Why do you have to put pressure on him? Like, if he's having a mental health crisis, you would expect people who are suffering mental health crisis to have episodes. Why couldn't you just leave him alone? He wasn't any harm to himself or to you since he was handcuffed and he's shackled. So it is inexplicable why they had to do this much restraint. And remember, Scott Bolden, y'all, this was 12 minutes that they stayed on top of him. 12 mm -hmm. minutes, a person in a prone position restrained, and if he's moving under them, it's because he's trying to breathe. Because it's a natural reaction if you're on your stomach on a hard surface, you cannot breathe even then, it's uncomfortable. So you automatically are lifting your head. You automatically are trying to get air in your system because your lungs are right near your chest cavity. And when you're on the ground, gravity is pulling you to the ground. It's just natural physics, and the police departments just don't seem to figure that part out yet. They just smothered him to death, man. It's, it's as sad as the uh, George Floyd case. They just smothered him. He is he asphyxiated. He just asphyxiated. Unbelievable. Yeah. Good luck with the case. Hey, thank you. Thank R you, Scott. Robert. Uh, and on this case, we, under, of course, understand sovereign immunity and qualified immunity. Is there any way to go after these uh, people who have been fired in their individual capacity, not just the people who are holding him down, but the folks who are just standing around looking at him? You know, we talked about the Tyree Nichols duty to intervene bill um, the, the, uh, is being added to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. But what can be done to uh, help people understand that if you see someone being murdered directly in front of you, uh, jump in and do something, save this person's life? And is there any way to hold these individuals? individuals liable? You know, beyond criminal Robert, I don't think there's anything civilly that could be done because of what's going on in uh, the United States Congress, uh, where they won't pass this George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that might attach some personal liability to officers in a civil manner. So right now, the taxpayers have to bear the brunt of this uh, outrageous conduct by these officers yet again. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Scott, until we can come up with a better solution, we just got to keep trying to bankrupt them, making it financially unsustainable for them to keep treating our people like this. Because, Roland Martin, we don't see videos of them killing white people like right. this. <laughs> yep, that's the case. Rebecca. Attorney Crump, you take on a lot of cases like this, and oftentimes you're standing in the gap to make sure that these families, these black families, are receiving justice. So my question for you is, as a black community, how can we support you as you can continue doing this fight? Because I know it's tough, it's hard, it has to be mentally draining and taxing. How can we support you in the work that you're doing? Now, thank you, Queen, so much for that. Uh, some of the basic things we got to do more, we got to show up for jury duty. I mean, it, that makes all the difference in the world if we have people who understand the life experiences and the communities where people like Ivo, Tyree Nichols, George Floyd, Trayvon, Brianna, where we come from, where we don't have to spend, I don't know, Scott Bowden, the first two days in court trying to convince them that Trayvon mm -hmm. was just walking home, that George Floyd was not trying to hurt the police, you know, simple things mm -hmm. like that. That's number one. And then I've invited Roland Martin down, Rebecca, and hopefully Scott Bowden will come down to Miami, that we have the Ben Crump College of Law. And what we're trying to do is prepare the next generation of social justice engineers and civil mm -hmm. rights attorneys. So hopefully come down and you donate to the scholarship funds to get black and brown people who have done everything right. Robert, they've 
got good grades. They kept their nose clean. They did good on the LSAT. And the only thing stopping them from uh, going through law school and becoming lawyers is financial uh, support. So those are ways that we can help because, as Thurgood Marshall said, it's going to take an army of us civil rights lawyers to fight against racism and discrimination in America. Indeed. Ben Crump, we appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. I love you, Roland. Thanks, yes, Scott. Thanks a lot. Right, now. Folks, going to a break, we come back. Bowie State honors the legend Dion Warwick. We'll tell you exactly how. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network YouTube. Hit that like button, y'all. We should easily be over 1,000 likes. Uh, same thing, folks, with the OTT app. Uh, hit us there as well. Don't forget, support us in what we do. Download our app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. A lot of y'all watching on YouTube. Don't even subscribe to our channel. Hit the subscribe button on our channel as well. Uh, you can also support us by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible possible for us to do what we do. Uh, our costs run $190,000 a month for this show, for our staff, for our other five shows on the Black Star Network, our OTT app, our distribution, folks. And so there's a lot of things we got going, folks, and we're trying to build, again, the strongest, big, biggest, largest, most influential black news and information channel in the country. And so check in money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196. Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo, RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Coming up on the next Black Tape, a conversation with Professor Howard W. French on his new book, Born in Blackness, covering 600 years of global African history and helping us understand how the world we know today is a gift from black people. There could have been no West without Africa and Africa. That's on the next Black Table with me, Greg Carr, only on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Cupid, the maker of the Cupid Shuffle and the Wham Dance. What's going on? This is Tobias Trevelyan. And if you're ready, you are listening to and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Help me out. Three, two, one. 
on Saturday at Bowie State University, they unveiled the naming of their theater, the Dion Warwick Theater, uh, their Fine and Performing Arts Center. You see Dion Warwick uh, there, right by one with his pumping his fist at his BB Winings, a very dear friend of hers. Uh, that's President Bro, Bowie State President, right next to her. Uh, it was uh, a great uh, event on the Saturday. Uh, I was there, and they actually held their first performance uh, uh, for uh, in, in the presence of the legend Dion Warwick. Uh, and so here is some of what took place at Bowie State on Saturday. Uh, to introduce our amazing leadership and President Aminta H. Bro. Thank you once again, and thank you, Dr. Knight, for hearing that request that stands. You cannot retire. You need to keep coming back here because we need you. Thank you, Dr. Knight, for all that you have contributed to the university, and you continue to do so. I appreciate everyone being here today. I'm going to be brief. My time on the stage today is to read the proclamation that will go into the archives of the university. And I'd like to once again acknowledge everyone who's come out to support this historic event. Uh, I think there was one group that was not mentioned, and uh, that was the Divine Nine in here, because I see some folks in here. You need to give it up for the Divine Nine, because I saw a bunch of them out here. I knew I was going to start it. That's why I didn't say anything earlier. Okay, time is short. So moving on. <laughs> And then finally, before I read the proclamation, I also want to acknowledge the efforts of the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, who are in the audience today. Thank you to you and to Pastor Jenkins for your support of Bowie State University. The resolution for Ms. Dionne Warwick reads, whereas Ms. Dionne Warwick began singing in church during her childhood years in East Orange, New Jersey, and began singing professionally in 1961 after being discovered by Burt Bacharach and, and Hal David. And whereas Ms. Warwick's 1963 performance in Paris, France, skyrocketed her to international stardom, and she has earned 75 charted hit songs and sold over 100 million records. <laughs> and whereas Ms. Warwick is a six-time Grammy award-winning music legend, and cornerstone of American pop music and culture, and has been inducted into the Grammy Museum, R&B Music Hall of Fame, Hollywood Walk of Fame, and the Apollo Theater Walk of Fame. And whereas Ms. Warwick became the first African-American solo female artist of her generation to win the prestigious award for Best Contemporary Female Vocalist Performance. And whereas Ms. Warwick has distinguished herself over the span of a 60-year career as an international music icon and concert act, and whereas Ms. Warwick has supported and campaigned for many causes, charities, close to her heart, including AIDS, the Starlight Foundation, Children's Hospitals, World Hunger, Disaster Relief, and Music Education, and whereas Ms. Warwick's pride and joy are her two sons, singer, recording artist David Elliott, and Oscar-nominated producer Damon Elliott, and her family, and whereas Ms. Warwick bridged the gap to transcend racial, cultural, and musical boundaries and created a legacy that will forever remain a part of international allure, and whereas Ms. Warwick has recently inspired a new generation of listeners and followers through her presence on social media as the queen of Twitter. <laughs> now, therefore, be it resolved on April 1st, 2023, that the administration, faculty, staff, students, and alumni of Bowie State University celebrate the achievements of Ms. Dionne Warwick. Please give her a round of applause. And Ms. Warwick, may I? Administrator for years before I came to Bowie, uh, I had to, to figure out the whole dynamic of how what is supposed to happen to build a building in the state of Maryland because I'd never done it. 
So I got on my little tricycle and uh, went around and found out the name of the people that I should be talking to. And of course, that's the, the beginning of the story. The end of the story is, is here. We did it. So I, I'm extremely proud of that. And now back to the, the real moment, I am mostly proud of the fact that Ms. Warwick is putting her name on something that I helped build. I, I mean, just, I'm, I'm just so excited. Uh, normally when I stand in front of a group like this, I start crying, but today I'm not gonna cry. I'm just gonna smile and, and say, welcome. And um, of all the things in the world, Ms. Warwick, I just love you. I appreciate you so, so, so much. And thank you for allowing us to use your name to, to, to make this a, a more of a dynamic place for all these young people that we're trying to support. And thank you very much. Thank you. You can talk to family like that. You can talk to family. I love Joe Madison, but I love Dion Warwick more, way more than Joe Madison. Um, and I'm just here to love on her, and I'm going to introduce some other people who sent a video to love on her. But since I am in her theater, I might as well take advantage of it. And simply say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was, was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now in Dion Warwick's theater. I see. That's all I wanted to say. I wondered of a moment where the heart of an artist could just feel safe enough to wave to you and say, hey, auntie. <laughs> because love is paying our respect to that six-year-old child, that daydreaming you, the one who still wonders, the one who's done it and still doing it, the one who thought that this ground of a stage is safe enough for artists to find shelter. I wonder. Because love is paying our respect to that six-year-old child and saying thank you for your service. Now, I also want you to know, this theater bearing my name, I cannot lend my name to everything. <laughs> this is something I am so very, very not only happy, but proud to be able to say yes to 
there's only one other edifice that has my name attached to it. I went there as a grammar student, born and raised in East Orange, New Jersey. My grammar school now bears the Dion Ward Institute name. Yeah. yeah. So I want you to know I feel exceptionally privileged to have my name on those doors out there. And I also understand that too much is given, much is expected. Yes. I certainly do hope, as I said last night, and I continue to say, that I will be able to live up to the expectation that you all had from me. In your all faces, trust me, you will be seeing me. You know, you will never know when I'm going to show up. I'm like a bad penny. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much for making this all possible. Thank you. Thank you. You're a dream. Thank you. Uh, and everybody else that has been involved with this, I thank you. All of you. Yes. And I'll wait for those people. Well, when it was over, uh, first of all, I was actually sitting behind Dion Ward for the, uh, during the entire program. And, of course, right before she left, uh, she was being presented with some gifts by, uh, she's an honorary member of Zeta Phi Beta, and they presented her the gifts, and uh, we caught up with her and uh, got a chance to ask her a few questions. Your music. Doing anything. Let me tell you. You recognize good stuff. <laughs> good stuff to work with. Uh, and that saxophone solo was pretty cool. <laughs> Boy, how's not a home out? Okay? He did, did a wonderful job. What's next for you? I'm on my way to LA. I'm doing more up in Great Backyard, and then back home to Jersey, and then back on the road again. Oh, you saw Ross are coming right, but they standing right behind you. I think they got something for you. Sisters are here. That's all right. I'm gonna stay right here. Just... That was that presentation. Yep. We're gonna close the show. So you heard me reference uh, that saxophone solo, and so that was a graduate of Bowie State uh, who actually serenaded the audience and Dion Warwick with uh, her hit. A House is Not a Home, of course, also made famous by the great Luther Vandross. And that's how we're going to close out uh, today's edition of Roller Martin Unfiltered. Uh, don't forget, download our app. Be sure to contribute to uh, our show. Uh, join, uh, uh, this is, of course, how you can download the app. And, of course, contribute to our Brina Funk fan club as well. This is how you do so as well. Checking money orders, also Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, and Zelle. Folks, uh, we're going to take us out. Uh, again, this is from Bowie State on Saturday. Uh, a house is not a home. Uh, four minutes and four seconds of bliss. Holla! <laughs>